Our first speaker speaks no less than four languages. Unfortunately, Swedish is not one of them. <laughs> professor Pavel Kuchar is assistant professor at the Department of Economics and Finance at the University of Guanajuato in Mexico. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Turin and a master in political science from the Prague University of Economics. His research interests include the emergence of markets, how novelty is accepted, as well as historical analysis of liberalism and its preconditions. Pavel Kuchar is one of the most knowledgeable people on the history of surrogacy in the United States, and it's a great honor for us to have you here at Timber today. During the upcoming hour, Professor Kuchar will talk about the history of surrogacy and how a certain kind of entrepreneurs can contribute to and also push institutional change. Today's moderator um, is the director of the Timber Media Institute, Mr. Matsulin, who will guide us through the afternoon. If you would like to tweet or ask questions, just put a simple hashtag in front of Timbro, and it will be easier for us all to follow the discussion online. With that said, a warm welcome again, and with that, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Pavel Kuchar. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Lydia, for this uh, generous introduction. I'm very happy to be here at, uh, at Timbro with you. It's my first time in, in Sweden, uh, and uh, uh, I'm enjoying my stay here so, so far very, very much. I, uh, I'm originally from, from Czech Republic, uh, and I, I'm not adopted. I do not have any particular uh, interest in surrogate motherhood apart. Uh, from my curiosity, uh, uh, looking into the idea of how do we actually naturalize novelty, how do we turn new artifacts um, <clears throat> into things that can be meaningfully and uh, justly bought and, and, and sold um, within the market setting. And surrogate motherhood for me was a, was a, was a vehicle uh, of of, of studying um, this kind of this kind of a problem that a lot of economists uh, struggle uh, struggle with, so the the kind of an idea of how do we uh, set up and push uh, limits of markets uh, this is something that that motivates my uh, uh, my research in uh, in surrogate motherhood. Uh, I want to uh, start uh, a kind of a story. Um, setting up uh, the kind of a problem of emergence of, of markets um, in the 1970s <coughs> within the United States. And uh, the case of the United States is something that I focus on. Uh, my story is particular to the, to, to the United States, but um, I think there are some lessons that could be learned even from a setting uh, of other countries, such as, such as Sweden, perhaps. And the story starts with the problem of adoption market shortages in, in the 1970s. Uh, they are to some extent caused or determined by a uh, number of issues that uh, come together at the end of the 1970s, um, such as uh, the introduction and uh, availability of anti-conception, uh, changing economic and social circumstances of single women, um, single mothers, and heavily regulated uh, adoption market. All these things uh, coming together at the end of 1970s uh, result in a shortage of uh, suitable children that are available uh, for adoption uh, compared to the number of parents that would like to um, adopt. So demand for substitutes uh, is getting stronger and stronger. At the same time, in 1978, we have an invention, we have a technological change um, in vitro fertilization uh, has first uh, successfully um, produced life in vitro. Um, uh, an op a British couple, obstetrician um, called Patrick Steptoe, um, and a physician um, named uh, Robert Edwards, um, in 1978, um, first create life in vitro, Louis Brown um, is born. Um, and this is a technological change that uh, is not really introduced to solve the kind of a problem that we see in the adoption market shortages. 
uh, in the adoption market, but it will have some uh, impact on uh, on on this kind of a uh, on this kind of a problem. This um, technological change uh, essentially changes uh, the options of people to share and compartmentalize parts of their private lives. Something that was previously very private now, thanks to this technology, can really be compartmentalized and shared, uh, even potentially sold. This is something that pioneers of uh, surrogate motherhood come to, uh, come to see. Um, why not use this new technology to match people, right? To match these parents that would like to adopt children but have to wait in lines for a couple of years and then are kind of uncertain whether they will end up with the children. Uh, why not match these people with women that are willing to share their reproductive capacities? Um, this is something that the pioneers of surrogate motherhood uh, start asking at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s in, in the United States. Um, and they see a very kind of um, new open field in front of them. One of those entrepreneurs says that, well, anyone can basically come up and start a surrogate motherhood business right now. Some of them are very optimistic, perhaps even naive. They want to have offices around the country and in England and Middle East and become the Coca-Cola of surrogate parenting industry. I want you to pay attention to, uh, to this entrepreneur, <coughs> Noel Keane, um, who, is an, who, who was an uh, attorney, who was a lawyer from Michigan, and he was very active, he was very important in legitimizing and spreading uh, and turning the new invention into useful innovation for people interested in, in, in parenting. He very early on recognized that there are technically feasible but legally unrecognized solutions to marital and reproductive uh, problems. And so these legally unrecognized solutions, they create a great deal of uncertainty about legal consequences. Um, and something must be done with that. This is what he recognized. This is a problem that will have to be solved. We have removed the technological obstacle, but there are institutional obstacles that are in front of us. Another lawyer from, from Pennsylvania realized that this new um, interaction of matching people who are willing to offer uh, their reproductive capacities and who demand their reproductive capacities is not really illegal or illegal. Uh, there is no law. We haven't really decided what kind of rules should we apply to uh, uh, regulate or to um, enforce agreements that emerge and apply. And this entrepreneur, this, this lawyer basically says we're creating the law right now as we go, as we, as we participate in these transactions, we are creating um, the law. So the, the, the problem is how do we make sense of surrogate motherhood? What it is that we talk about when we talk about surrogate? Well, people used humor first to um, reconcile these, these questions, right? Surrogate motherhood comes with ethical consequences and moral dilemmas and you just add lawyers and then the result is as good as homemade. Uh, this is a joke that uh, appeared at the beginning of, of the 80s in a newspaper. It creates problems for people who participate in, in, in surrogacy, especially for, for mothers, a lot of confusion uh, that happens. So this kind of humor is something that people used in order to cope with, with this kind of... Um, uh, uh, she says, that's the last time I act as a surrogate mother. She's confused, she's not very happy about the situation that she's in right now. If we want to define surrogate motherhood in a more serious way, we could say that um, it is a contractual separation of genetic, gestational and rearing aspects of procreation that is possible by way of scientific and technological progress. Very broadly, we could say that surrogate motherhood is an agreement to conceive a child by other means than sexual intercourse. So this is what we talk about when we talk about surrogate motherhood in the United States uh, at the beginning of, um, of the 1980s. Um, so this new technology and this matching that satisfies some kind of a need that is there at the beginning of the 80s 
gives rise to things like this. This is an advertisement that appeared in a Kansas newspaper in something like 1983, I think. Uh, Junction City Union, I think that was, the, that was the newspaper. And you see that someone is advertising, looking for surrogate mothers that are needed for infertile couples, must be over 21, must have given birth, medical and living expenses paid for 10 months, hey, Gar Institute, Top Topeka, Kansas. Even the act of publishing this kind of advertisement in a newspaper today would be illegal in some jurisdictions. No, I'm not even talking about this, this transaction, but just the act of publishing and uh, adver advertising for, for a surrogate mother would, in some places, perhaps like Washington, D.C., um, and other jurisdictions in the United States, that would be illegal in, it, in itself. Um, but there is some heterogeneity in, in, in the United States, and some kind of a market has developed. So you have now places where even advertising would be illegal, and then you have some other places where you can advertise, you can contract uh, a woman that, that, that will uh, share her reproductive capacities um, uh, with you, with, with the uh, intended parents, and somewhere you can pay for that um, transaction. So my question is, how did this process of negotiating the meaning of a new technology, of this new invention, how did this process uh, went about? And I said that the technological obstacles, that was the easy part. That was something that happened in 1978. Um, but there were institutional obstacles in front of people who would like to use this invention and turn it into something meaningful, into something useful, into an innovation that could solve some kind of a problem for them. And it is very ironic that these institutional obstacles... Um, I think I turn it down. Uh, turn it off. I think these institutional obstacles uh, were so inconceivable that even the inventor, even the physician that first made it possible for life to be created in vitro, thought that this technology shouldn't be applied in the context of sharing reproductive capacities, in the context of uh, surrogate motherhood. He said later on, in the two years after the invention happened, well, you can't just come and stick some egg and sperm together in a culture medium. The use of surrogate mothers to carry a child for another couple should not be practiced. In effect, the medical situation, the technological problem, is then replaced by a much more complicated medical, medical legal situation. So the idea is how do we deal with that medical legal situation? How do we deal with this kind of a problem? If surrogacy was to become a useful innovation, really, that obstacle, that medical legal situation has to be uh, removed. So the idea is how to make sense of the act of birth in the context of the new assisted rep rep reproductive technology. And I want to point out really the activity of those entrepreneurs, of those lawyers and other people that started matching people and started challenging the existing legal framework. That, as they argued, was really not suited, that was not really fit, that was not very useful for the new um, phenomenon. So it was Noel Keen who was filing cases in order to test the legal environment. In very early on, in March 78, uh, the Wayne Judge County, which is in Michigan, for, uh, for the first time approved the adoption of a child born to a surrogate mother uh, that, who was artificially <coughs> Artific artificially inseminated, so she shared also her, her genes, she, she also shared her, her genetic material. And that was a big success for Keen because he says this is the first time that someone did it legally. Someone came out and someone used the legal process. It has finally been disclosed on the surface that a surrogate has done it for someone else. That was a big success. We have recognized that there is some, some kind of a transaction of this kind happening. When Noel Keane tried to do it again, but introduced money in, uh, in the 1980s, he was turned down. And the judge said, the Michigan Court of Appeals said, if you want to go through with that transaction, we will apply the adoption law, and you will essentially be selling children, and that's illegal. Uh, so that is something where he bounced against the wall. 
But nevertheless, he and other entrepreneurs continued challenging uh, the existing code. And the problem that we find here, and that is interesting, is that in both of these cases, it is the adoption code that covers the practice of surrogate motherhood. And as those entrepreneurs would come to argue, the adoption code is not particularly well suited for this kind of a, uh, arrangement uh, because we're dealing with something else. We're not dealing with adoption. And this is something that I'm going to explain uh, later on. It is important to skip a couple of years to August 1985. And this is another milestone moment. Again, Noel Keen was there. Um, this is the first time that would become known as gestational surrogacy, meaning that the embryo created in vitro uh, would be carried by a woman who has no really genetic relation to, uh, to, 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 to the embryo. Um, she would be a career, gestational career. Uh, the judge that was deciding or that was uh, administrating this, uh, this case was really marveling at the situation that we're in uh, because she said, well, this is a very strange situation. We do not really have any kind of a definition of mother. We never used it. It was very common sense. We've always seen a woman. That woman was giving birth. No one in their right mind could really doubt that the woman who just gave birth to a child is a mother. Why would we need the definition of something as pretty natural as mother? And she said, in this case, we actually need it. Um, because in this case, as Noel Keane pointed out, we do not actually put the name of the woman who just gave birth to a child on a birth certificate. This is a big kind of a legal innovation that happens. But the problem is, well, who is the mother? A confusion kind of appears. Noel Keane said this is the first time that a birth mother, the woman who just gave birth to a child that was not genetically related to her, will not be placed on a birth certificate. We have always assumed that the woman who gives birth is the mother, but in this particular case, the mother has no legal right to the child. It's not hers, right? She has no legal right, no legal responsibility. It is the contracting couple. It, it is the parents that contracted her that have legal rights to the child from the, be from the beginning. They are on the birth certificate. In this moment, motherhood is reinterpreted. This is important. This is a very important legal uh, and social kind of an innovation because at the moment where the birth mother's name is not on the birth certificate, different legal doctrines of establishing motherhood, of establishing the right to the children and the responsibilities to, 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 to the child appear. The mother now could be genetical, whose genes is it that the child is carrying? She could be gestational, because the woman that is actually carrying the child could be different from the woman that is genetically related to that child. And also, mother could be established based on a contractual doctrine, based on a contractual principle, meaning that she doesn't have to be really genetically related to the child. She could use a donor of the egg, for example. She doesn't have to gestate the child. She could use a carrier with the, with the egg that was donated. She could be just a contractual mother. The woman that signed the papers and said, I want to use your reproductive capacities, and I am the mother, right? This was the case that happened in 1985. It was the contractual mother that was her, whose name was written on the birth certificate. And this is, uh, this is very important. I'm going to explain why, is, why, is, why, is, why does this matter. Besides the reinterpretation of motherhood, what was also changing was the climate of opinion. Climate of opinion, whether it is a good or a bad thing to hire a woman and use her reproductive capacities, that was also developing and that was also a result of, uh, of the efforts of the pioneers, of the entrepreneurs of surrogate motherhood. And one of the very important moments was the Baby M case in uh, 1987. It was uh, very medialized. Um, and to some extent, it could, be under, it could be seen as a kind of a loss. Um, so it is almost as if you read an existential drama from, from Dostoevsky, because here you have Mary Beth Whitehead. She was the surrogate. 
She offered her reproductive capacity. She offered her her genes as well, and she was a lower middle income uh, person. Uh, she was her her husband uh, was was a garbage man, so they were not particularly well off. On the other hand, William Stern and Elizabeth Stern they couldn't conceive. Elizabeth Stern uh, had some medical difficulties that prevented her from from conceiving a child. They were a couple that was well educated. Upper middle class; they were economically well off. Um, and furthermore, besides the the medical problems of Elizabeth Stern, William Stern uh, was uh, the last member of of a family who who deceased during the Second World War. So for him, having a genetically related children was crucial. It was not it was not a game. It was not a joke that he was playing. Right? What happened is. Mary Beth Whitehead decided that she's going to default on the contract. When the child was born, she said, "You know what? I'm not giving her up. I signed these papers, but I didn't understand what I'm doing, and I'm not giving you the child." She ran away. Uh, she was on a run for about three weeks, um, and it was a very touching story. You can actually um, find a movie about it. But what happened when this problem was brought to a court? The judge. You can't see it, but here's his name, Harvey Sorko, in New Jersey. Said, "You signed a contract, and the contract is going to be enforced. So it is not your child. William Stern is going to be the father, uh, and he is going to get the child into into his custody." What happened is that Mary Beth White had appealed, and the Court of Appeals of New Jersey overturned that decision, and said. This contract is not enforceable because it violates public policy of New Jersey. We will not take genetically related children from their mothers. <laughs> But nevertheless, it is in the best interest of the child who has already been living for more than a year with uh, Elizabeth um, and uh, William Stern to stay with them. So it was a kind of a Solomonic decision, saying these contracts are against the public policy, but the child stays with those contractual parents. In that sense, again,、uh, Noel Keen hits the wall because he's not able to persuade nor the judge nor the public that we should have markets and enforceable contract that whose consequences will be taking genetically related children from their mothers. He was not able to do that, but nevertheless, this case was a big victory、uh, to some extent for Stern, for Noel Keen, the entrepreneur, and this is how he took it, because what you can see happens is. Spikes in、uh, this is my <coughs> do-it-yourself engram. I looked for、uh, I looked through Google News and searched for surrogate motherhood or surrogacy,、uh, surrogacy, and、um, you find that there are spikes in in all the regions of the United States, Midwest, Northeast, South, and West. In 1987, all the newspapers write about surrogacy. Everyone talks about、uh, surrogacy.、Um, Here you see that it is, of course, very much pronounced in the Northeast, less pronounced in the West, California, Portland,、um, Washington. You see another kind of spikes here in the West. That's something that I'm going to mention later on. But this is very important because it raises awareness. The baby and trial, although it was not a victory for a,、uh, for the entrepreneur,、uh, it motivated a conversation. And it raised the percentage of population that was aware about that about the problem, about social problem of translating a new technology into something that would be useful. And you see that after 19, sorry, after 1987, after the lower court enforced the contract, almost everyone in the United States, in a Gallup poll, said we know that there is something like a surrogacy, and we know that. Surrogacy is a kind of a problem. Furthermore, the judicial decision that enforced the contract on the mother had a strong affirmative effect. The reasoning that the judge used and that was then used in newspapers convinced a lot of people, and this is a couple of weeks, three or four weeks maybe, that the mother should not have a right to change her mind. That this is an important feature, contract enforcement. Is very important, and you see that 
before the trial had started, about two thirds, about that. After three or four weeks, you have 13 percent uh, added to this. So, this kind of a public discussion uh, changes the climate of opinion, and I think that uh, really the efforts both of of the judge and those entrepreneurs uh, are really important to recognize there. You also see that the median person that, that you find in the States changes her or his idea about whether surrogacy is a good thing to do. So you see that in 1983, the median person here in the center is not really sure anywhere in the States uh, whether, whether surrogacy is a good thing. You see that on the left you have people who approve, on the right you have people who disapprove, the median voter here says, well, I don't know if it's a good thing or not. Within 10 years, the median voter throughout the United States would say, I think that surrogacy is a virtuous thing. I think surrogacy is a, is, is, is a good thing to do. So this, there is a change of, uh, of a climate of opinion. And last uh, moment there that is really important in the in, at, at the beginning of the 90s is the case of Johnson versus Calvert that happened in California. And in California, this was a case of gestational surrogacy, so the mother was not genetically related to the child, but she nevertheless decided to bail on those uh, intended parents and default on the contract, saying, I am keeping the, the child. The lower court ruled against her and said, you signed the papers, you're not the mother, you don't have any right to, to keep the child. She appealed. The California Supreme Court said, the lower court was right. Gestational surrogacy contracts are enforceable, do not violate public policy, and in a case of contested gestational surrogacy agreement, the intentions and the aim in conceiving the child should determine the parentage. So this is important because the innovation that was introduced, the legal innovation that was introduced in 1985, you have mother, motherhood established by intention, is now legally confirmed by California Supreme Court, and you have a legal precedent that basically transforms our understanding of what motherhood is and how is it established within one decade. Right? The traditional belief that a birth mother is also the legal mother came, came to be reconsidered. You have those two things at play. That cognitive frame of what motherhood is and changing cl the, the climate of opinion that uh, is changing the situation. Why am I talking about this? Why does it matter? Right. Why does the interpretation of motherhood in the context of new technology matter? The single key thing that I want to call your attention um, to here is the idea of contract enforcement. Why is contract enforcement a good thing? If you basically live um, in a world where the rules are not really defined, then you don't know what, what is it that you're getting into. And when, when you don't know what you're getting into, you don't know what will happen when something get, goes wrong. You don't know what happens when a child, is born a child is born disabled. You don't know what happens when three child appear and you just wanted one. Uh, you don't know what happens when the mother decides to change her mind. When this happens, uh, people that are uh, participating in these transactions are really subject to great uncertainty and can't really select themselves out. They say, you know what, I will try it, and if something goes wrong, then I will, I will go from there. But what happens is, for example, a case that happened in Czech Republic a couple of months ago, is that two children were born, one was disabled, and the parents said, you know what, we don't want the second one. You keep it and do whatever you want. If contracts are enforceable, if there is full contract enforcement, then at the moment when you sign the contract, you are the parent of the child. And when the child gets born, you have the rights and the responsibilities for it. What is important when you have cases of traditional surrogacy, a lot of states, for example, give time for, for the mother to change her mind. Three days, let's say. So after the child is born, the mother has three days to say, yes, I actually meant what I signed, and you can take the child. In those three days, the child is as if it were without a parent. The mother is not really the mother because she can say, 
it's mine or it's not. And the intended par parents are not really parents because they have to wait for the mother to give her consent. There is some kind of intermediate agency that takes custody. That usually is the local government that is kind of a formal par parent of, of the child in, in, that, in that meantime. You see that the rules are really arbitrary in that sense. This is something that you can't consider to be contract enforcement. It is very arbitrary and it is not stated up front. When the rules are well defined, contract enforcement matters because it mitigates uncertainty. People can select themselves out. If you have doubts about uh, your ability to go through the process, relinquish the child, you will not do it because you know that the rules will be enforced. If you are not sure that you can go through a transaction where you will have to pay a lot of money, uh, then you will not to have a child, then you will not really do it. This is a process uh, that selects people to participate in surrogacy who are apt to, to do it. Without it, there is a great deal of, of contractual uncertainty and the transaction costs of going through surrogacy are very high. Second thing, contractual enforcement make, makes it clear whether you can pay or not for that transaction. This is a question that we might ask, well, how many surrogates should we have? How many surrogates do we need in Sweden? We don't know that, right? This is something that you know when you use the price mechanism. And when the prices tell you how much does it take to hire a surrogate, how much can I get for sharing my reproductive uh, capacities that I can do through uh, um, the technological uh, advances that, that we have assembled. Noel Keane in, in the 80s said, unless surrogate mothers can be offered a meaningful compensation for their services, very few children will be brought legally into the world in this manner, right? The problem is that if full contractual enforcement is an important thing, because it creates rules, and we know that they will be uh, enforced, then if you only apply those rules to people who do not pay for those services, then there is still really a great number of people who would like to pay or be paid for those services, but those clearly defined rules do not apply for them, because they are in the, in the legal void. Uh, they are not really subject to that contractual enforcement. And this is what he says here, very small, number of children will be brought legally. If you prohibit contractual surrogacy, that doesn't mean that people will stop doing it. Right? People will still be paying for those services, but will be doing that in a semi-legal or illegal way. A prohibition of compensation, as Keane said, for surrogate motherhood is equivalent to a prohibition of the practice itself. And I have looked actually uh, into the numbers in the United States, and in the United States, you can actually see uh, that there are something like four different legal regimes of contractual enforcement of surrogate motherhood. You have legal void, you have legal inaction. This is the most common. The states do not have any kind of a law, so you don't know whether the contract, contract is enforceable or not. You have a prohibition. It is illegal to go through that. If you, if you hire a surrogate, you will go to jail. And then there are states who actually enforce those contracts. Some of them have statutes and they regulate the practice, and some of them have case law. Case law is the most liberal of those enforcement mechanisms um, because it basically says, unless there is duress, unless the agreement is unconscionable, unless you press the women into that, any kind of a contract will be enforceable. Those terms that those parties agree on, we will enforce them. This is not the case mostly in the statutory regulation because there are strings attached. And those strings tell you the contract enforcement only applies to parents that we have screened before. So they must be fit to become parents. We will send someone, we will review them, and then if we find them to be fit, they can go through. The mother must have some qualities. The mother will have to go through psychological screening that is administratively uh, certified. Uh, the mother sometimes uh, is required to already go through a pregnancy. That means 
a lot of people do not qualify for contractual enforcement because a lot of people do not qualify for these conditions. And what you see when you compare the numbers here on this axis, you have a number of surrogate motherhood pregnancies within a state per year divided by 1,000 women aged 15 to 44. So basically, for a population of fertile women in a given state in a given year, what number of surrogate motherhood pregnancies do we see? And we see that the most liberal case law ordering um, enforcement regime has twice as much surrogate motherhood pregnancies than states that legalize surrogacy but re regulate it, and obviously than states that do not have any kind of legal regime or states that prohibit it. What is really interesting here is that statistically there is really no difference between these three legal regimes. The state, the state within the United States that enforces but regulates surrogate motherhood is really in many situations not very different from the states that prohibit it. A lot of people do not qualify for contractual enforcement in states that regulate surrogate motherhood. This is what Keane said here. A prohibition on compensation for surrogate motherhood is equivalent to a prohibition of the practice. This is something that you actually empirically see 30 years after Noel King said that. Right? Here, many of those states prohibit paid surrogacy, and they are actually not very different from those states that prohibit surrogacy altogether. This is what you see in, in, in this graph. This is the take-home, this is the lesson, right? Regulatory strings attached make a difference in terms of whether <coughs> legislation will actually help people and serve them to set up rules that will be clearly defined and strictly enforced. Those regulatory strings attached, they sometimes make those rules vaguer, they make them apply only to some people, they do not make it clear whether they will be enforced in the end. The final point that I have, maybe to open some kind of a discussion, whether a market in, in, in surrogacy is the only solution for us. Is it necessarily the case that the new technology that we have here from the 1978 has to lead to a market where we have advertisements, buyers and sellers? Um, and I would ask you to uh, look for international cases of naturalizing uh, this new technology. A very prominent and uh, curious, interesting case is Israel. There is a lot of scholarship done on Israeli surrogacy. Uh, Israel has a kind of a cultural and ideological, uh, historical uh, background uh, that makes it praiseworthy for people to be fruitful and to multiply. The number of fertility clinics in Israel per capita is four times as higher than in the United States. The Israeli state is an industrial complex for producing children to, to some extent, and that also applies to surrogate motherhood. Surrogate motherhood is subsidized, it is heavily regulated, states, the state encourages it, uh, and furthermore, there is also a social kind of an aspect to it that when a mother offers herself and offers her reproductive services to, um, to infertile couples, she becomes a kind of a public hero, she becomes a kind of a soldier in a sense that is offering her, uh, her service to, uh, to, um, uh, to the maximum of be fruitful and multiply. So in that sense, Israel will not clearly uh, inspire uh, itself from California, right? The, the um, historical and cultural and ideological background of Israel is very different, um, and the technology is naturalized in a very different way than it is in places like California or um, Nevada um, or some other places. So internationally, even places like Sweden really have to think through a, through a negotiation, uh, through a public discussion that will involve those uh, intended parents, very good work has been done by the uh, presenter that comes after me, that will involve uh, the entrepreneurs, that will legitimate this, uh, this practice, and that will also involve entrepreneurs in the political arena um, that will come up with legal and regulatory innovation that will or will not uh, make the useful and meaningful uh, application of this new technological innovation that we have uh, possible. We know from economics that uh, division of labor gives us technological progress 
and we know that division of labor is only limited by the extent of the market, how many people can we actually deal with. Uh, uh, but here in this discussion that I am actually talking about and that I open with, uh, we should really in a public discussion think about what limits do we as a society, as a community, decide to put on the division of labor. How much can you compartmentalize? How much can you offer and share, right? Uh, with other people, how much can you offer and share for money? Technology gives us a lot of opportunities to do that. Sharing economy, right? Air bed and breakfast. Now we can do that also with parts of our bodies. The question is how to legitimate that, uh, how to have a discussion that will make it legitimate and even virtuous to ask money for sharing uh, something that might serve other people. So with that, I conclude. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Pavel, for a fascinating presentation and, and insights in the American perspective on, on, on this uh, fascinating issue. I was just thinking, I am, you, will, you will get some questions here from the audience, I'm sure. We have 15 minutes, so please prepare questions. But I, I think I, uh, I, I would, would like to start. Uh, could, could you describe what a contract like this is really made up of? For instance, how much money are we talking about? Um, I heard uh, 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 on the Swedish media outlet that some Swedish people paid around $40,000, American dollars, for, yeah. for doing this. Is that, a, is that a, a, a relevant figure? So I think it, it really depends. The way how this industry is really uh, organized uh, today is that you tend to have in the United States uh, surrogate motherhood agencies. And that surrogate motherhood agency ty typically uh, has a woman who has been a surrogate mother in her life, so she's the boss, she's the director. It has a physician, an obstetrician, that's also part of that agency, and it has a lawyer. And that's an agency, that's something like a firm. And those agencies tend to hire surrogates. So they have a list, they have a waiting list, there are women, they are ready to uh, offer their services. Um, and they just wait for intended parents to come in and ask for, for a surrogate. You have to pay to all those people. Mm. You have to pay to the obstetrician, you have to pay to the lawyer, you have to pay to the surrogate. Uh, I think that we, in the United States, uh, the price for all these costs can go up to perhaps 180 or $200,000. Oh. And of Quite course, of course the, the pay that uh, goes to surrogate is a fraction of this. A lot to the lawyer then. Or <laughs> a lot to the lawyer, a oh, lot how much to a the mother. A lot the to the agency, a lot mm -hmm. to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to the physician. Mm -hmm. How much to the mother, do you know? Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not really sure about the details uh, of, of, of the market, but I think that the number that, that, that you said could be about right. Mm -hmm. Something uh, in between twenty to $40,000 mm -hmm. perhaps could be... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you would have to trust the mother of, of uh, living a very healthy life during this, this, uh, the, the time of pregnancy. Uh, is that regulated? Like health rules, eating, drinking? Uh. So this is, this is what the agency is good for. This is what, uh, mm. um, what the agency does for those intended parents. Mm. Medical checkups, um, mm. uh, figuring out whether the, the, the mother um, <coughs> does not really pose a threat mm. to, to the child. It is quite curious how this problem is being solved internationally. Uh, you might have heard that in India we have boarding houses. Uh, so boarding houses in a sense that the mother comes, she signs up, she becomes uh, fertilized and she's locked up for something like 10 or 11 months in a boarding house where she's being taken care of, she's being screened, mm. and then she's paid a lot of money. Um, so this is how India, for example, I think yeah. India has two really prominent clinics. Uh, and this is how India mm. solved that problem. That's not really uh, feasible in places no. like the United States, um, but some kind of monitoring. Yeah. And obviously there has been a lot, lot of debate on the legal issues here, but have, have you had the same sort of debate concerning the, the interest of the child, uh, health, um, yeah, risks so of, of different kinds? So this is something uh, that I have read uh, superficially on, um, and there is a lot of uh, research uh, written on this. 
figure, trying to figure out whether this will not result in people or children that are disabled that came through a mm -hmm. process of birth and gestation that is different f from what we are used to. Uh, it is interesting that the baby M, uh, Melissa Stern, is now around 30 years. Mm. She did her PhD mm. at King's College London, and she wrote a dissertation thesis on surrogate motherhood. Uh, none, uh, none, of her, none of the evidence so far show that children born through surrogacy are different, mm. um, have psychological problems that are mm. systematically mm. different from people born in a um, natural way. A lot of people even argue that if parents are willing to uh, spend so much money to have a child, that is a signal uh, that they are perhaps as loving as many parents that are willing to have the child or can have the child naturally. Mm. Right? This kind of selection uh, um, mechanism um, may be a signal that uh, there is a good kind of an environment, but also you have uh, you have very deep and, and, and dark uh, stories that uh, actually end up quite wrong, where parents that get the child from, uh, from, from a surrogate are perhaps not really um, prepared or ready to, to mm -hmm. have a child. Those are anecdotal evidences. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, shall we come, come back to that issue? We have a question down there. Please state your name and, and uh, your question, please. The Swedish Women's Lobby, which is the umbrella for the women's movement in Sweden. And um, we um, worry very much in the Swedish women's movement, as well as the women's movement globally, that the introduction of surrogacy motherhood is, leads to an exploitation of women's bodies and a new form of trade in women and children. And this is what we see in countries around the world, which has uh, introduced both compensated and non-compensated um, uh, uh, surrogacy and I wonder um, after hearing your presentations we have so many questions because this is very unpleasant to listen to but I wonder um, how can you guarantee that women are not exploited in this trade problem it, it was the and I agree with you this this is a big problem I uh, I uh, live and work in Mexico right now and Mexico has not really had any kind of a discussion that we're having here and that has been taking place in the United States for the last 30 years, precisely because no one really cares about whether women are exploited or not, right? I think that uh, um, it is actually a feat or a great kind of an achievement of society, such as the US society or the Swedish society, that we actually care for the right of the mother because through a couple of thousand years, no one cared about the right of the mother of the child. The child was just taken from her. Uh, this, was, this, this is the biblical story of Hagar. Um, and I think that the, that the solution that I and you worry about uh, to the exploitation of women is precisely contractual enforcement. Unless contracts are enforced, unless the rights and responsibilities of the contractual parties are clearly defined before the transaction takes place, then you can't really be sure that the rights of that women will or will, will, will be um, protected. Yeah. And so I think that it is not really the market that, that, that exploits the woman. Um, you, and this, this, this is the case of, um, of, of interviews of those Swedish couples uh, that have observed firsthand uh, what does this kind of transaction do to an in, to a average Indian woman, right? She, she doesn't really have very good opportunities ahead of her. The, the, the work options are probably not very good, and now she can actually go to that boarding house, spend 10 or 11 months there, and then get a lot of money, send her children to uh, the university, uh, fix her house, I don't know, whatever the woman might be interested in. If you prohibit that, you are sentencing the woman to the option that you find not really desirable in the first place. The exploitation does not happen through that voluntary mar market transaction. The exploitation comes from rules that are imprecisely defined. If you have imprecisely defined rules, and I think this is the great danger that you and me are worried about, then exploitation happens, right? Then this was the case in Russia 
intended parents, they hire three different surrogate mothers independently. All of them give birth to a child, and then the parents come and say, I don't like this one, I don't like this one, I will take this one. This is a very botched case that only can exist because there are no rules to be enforced. If those two mothers could take those parents to a judge, then there would not really be any kind of an exploitation in the sense that those women would not have to go through the pains of being artificially uh, inseminated, carry carrying the child to the term and then <coughs> being left with it, right? So I think that cl clearly defined rules and strict contractual enforcement is a good step toward mitigating exploitation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Can I just comment? Just a very, short one. Very shortly. We have a few That's more. A, yes, I see, I see your, your point, though, when you talk about the, the contract enforcement, it's in the favor of the ordering parents and not the surrogate mother. And uh, I mean, uh, even if in countries like, like uh, the UK, which have uh, introduced non-compensated uh, surrogacy, they have these contracts and it's always in favor of the ordering couples and the situation you, you talked about with this whitehead wo woman, I mean, all of her life it might be destroyed. I mean, we know these cases from the US as well with these surrogate mothers that changed their mind, they feel emotional about this baby, they yeah. don't want to give it up or they want to have contact with the child and they feel so, I mean, th th it's human people and babies and we're talking about, so it's not products, yes. uh, which, which makes it a little more complicated than, uh, than I, the I, law I, contract I think, enforcement. Uh, we, we, we yes, get absolutely. Pro probably you Thank can you. comment on this shortly and then we will uh, have another question, please. Probably would you like to comment more on this? or you, you, We will come back to this, I'm sure, in the next presentation. I think, that, uh, I think that the Mary Beth Whitehead, the baby M case, was precisely a problem of uh, vaguely defined rules. Um, and uh, so I said that before. The other thing that you mentioned is that the terms are always in favor of the intended parents. I don't really see empirical evidence for this. And I see that when, whenever there is a contract that those parties are voluntarily willing to get into, then by definition, both of those parties must be better off. Some of one bargaining party might be more better off than the other bargaining party. That's subjective. I don't know how, we, how would you decide that. Uh, but when I talk about full contractual enforcement, I talk about uh, contracts that are voluntary. That means you are not cheated into this. You are not forced into the agreement on a gunpoint or on a force of you would starve to death if you didn't agree on that. That contract would, of course, not be voluntary. That contract would, would not, of course, be enforceable. Right? This is a standard um, judicial definition of a voluntary uh, contract. And I think really that full contract for enforcement and clearly defined rules are uh, preventing these kind of uh, uh, catastrophic situations, as was the case in the Mary Beth Whitehead case. Mm. Okay, next question, please. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. And I very much appreciate that you're taking a contractual uh, view of the topic and trying to see how con contracts could protect the rights of everyone mm. in involved. It's mm. a very interesting argument. But unfortunately, I, I, I have looked into this issue and we're not there. I would last, like to ask your comment on what's happening in India right now, now with the assisted reproductive technology bill where the Indian government is trying to ban uh, surrogate motherhood for non-Indian nationals or the government of Italy is doing, well, where the uh, interior minister said that wombs for rent should be punished as sex offenders, hmm. mainly in order to yeah. ban gay couples from right. using surrogate mothers. I agree that in many places uh, we're not there yet. Mexico is not there in the discussion about uh, contractual enforcement. Perhaps India is not there. Uh, to actually have a meaningful discussion in, about the contractual enforcement. Um, and this is why I mentioned, and I took great lengths to talk about those stories of reconsidering what motherhood is and saying that you're not adopting the child when you're hiring the surrogate. It's more like hiring a nanny. It's more like hiring a person that takes, that takes care of the child, of the fetus that is already yours. Because after that happens, you're not adopting anymore. You're a parent. And if you sign the paper, that means your rights and your responsibilities are there at, at the moment when the child is born. 
reinterpretation is first thing. That probably didn't happen in Italy. That probably might be a problematic thing in Sweden or in the rest of the Europe. Second thing, the climate of opinion, right? You must have a meaningful part of the society actually thinking that this is a virtuous, and legitimate and just thing to do. Unless you can persuade as an entrepreneur, as a politician, as a surrogate, people that are around you in your community that this is a le legitimate thing to do, then you will probably not be able to have a meaningful discussion about contractual enforcement. Um, and I think that this is what needs to proceed before we can talk about the legal problem. And that probably didn't take place yet in places like India or Mexico, for that matter. We Thank have you. another question, please. Uh, can we få micken framåt? Tack. Since you have please, so uh, your name, please, also Smedler, uh, I appreciate very much your thorough review of the legal situation. However, there are still a lot of uh, areas where we would have to continue the work. Um, in Sweden, for instance, it is not, uh, and in many countries, you cannot buy organs for transplantation. But uh, in your presentation, we are talking about a compensation for. Uh, the gestational mother. How do you conceive of, uh, or how do you compare the yeah. two? So, these are um, things that broadly are research under the umbrella of something that we might call contested commodities. Uh, organ uh, donation, uh, but perhaps even things like uh, human trafficking, uh, they all might fall into the uh, uh, area of interactions that we're not too familiar, that we're not too um, comfortable with. And of course, selling children after when you pay for adoption is prohibited all over the world. Uh, selling organs is prohibited. Uh, I think that in many cases, the reasons that justify, or at least the economic reasons that are used as justification of those prohibitions do not hold water. Um, and I think that the, the, the previous question that I, that I got, why are we not there yet so that we could talk about contractual enforcement of surrogate motherhood, we haven't really decided what is it that surrogate motherhood womb rental is like. Is it like adoption where we're selling children and that's prohibited because it's a kind of a human trafficking? Or is it more like hiring a nanny, where we have a child, we contract someone to take care of it. In that sense, this would be completely legal. This kind of discussion, I think, has to precede the contractual uh, discussion whether it is something that we permit or not. It's the kind of cognitive conceptualization of what, what motherhood is and how it can be established. To, I guess, answer your question in a simple way, I don't think that surrogate motherhood is the same thing as selling organs or selling, um, selling, sell, selling people. I think it is hiring reproductive capacities. It's hiring labor to, 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 to make a pun. Uh, please, just to, uh, not happy with the answer here. So. There is a Sweden a law against uh, sexual uh, uh, service, selling sexual services. Uh, so in a way, we could then take Buying, <laughs> buying right. sexual services, sorry. Uh, uh, and uh, if uh, we're talking about hiring a womb, this would rather, in Swedish uh, legal uh, opinion, perhaps compare to yes. uh, buying sexual services. So I, this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say that the discussion has to be, has to be gone through that will meaningfully justify how a certain artifact can be used in a setting like Israel, like United States, like Italy, or like Sweden. In Israel or in India, perhaps uh, buying a prostitute is not illegal, so people do not really have to justify why surrogate motherhood is different from buying a prostitute. I see a difference. I see that the difference is clear in the intention of those contractual parties. Mm. And the intention is furthermore different uh, then if you're buy, buying a child for the purposes of smuggling it and then selling it on a black market for uh, 
unsavory uh, labor market practices. Um, I see this transaction is uh, clearly different. Okay, thank you, Pavel. Uh, we will come back to you in the end of the seminar uh, when we discuss all together. But uh, thanks uh, very much for a great, uh, interesting presentation. I would like very much to appreciate your invitation and your insightful and challenging questions. Yeah. Uh, thank thank you. you. Let's give him a hand again.